live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. Hi, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Happy Thursday. Welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Look at this fabulous crowd. Yeah. All to talk about space stuff, right? Who knew everybody got that excited about gravitational waves? Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's our speaker. She's kind of internet famous a little bit. How many of you in the room follow Astro Katie on Twitter? That's all right. Well, we just got you a lot more followers, I think. And everybody knows a good look for you. Well, welcome to the Science Cafe, everybody. My name is Chris, your host tonight, and that means I get the pleasure and privilege of welcoming you and introducing our fabulous speakers that we bring here. Raise your hand this time if this is your first time to our Thursday Science Cafes. Fantastic. How come y'all don't come all the time? Every Thursday night here in the Daily Planet Cafe, we find experts in the world of science, technology, engineering, mathematics. We bring them here onto the Daily Planet Cafe stage, give them a few minutes to share with us what they're passionate about, what they're studying, learning about, and then we flip it on them. They talk for about 20 minutes, and then we get to chat with them for the remainder of the hour. So the Science Cafe is really cool because rather than watching a scientist, capital S, give a lecture, this is our chance to really engage with scientists, and you get to learn what you think is most interesting to you, right? You get to ask what's burning on your mind, what you've heard about, and that's what is my favorite part about the science cafes, at least, that we give you the chance to do this. And as far as I can tell, we're the only museum science cafe in the country that lets you do this every week. So we have awesome topics every Thursday night. And then the first Thursday night is science trivia. Get your team come out, win prizes. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? So I hope that all of you first time visitors will come back and see me again here at the cafe. For everyone who, if this is at least your second science cafe, I'm glad you came back. It's now time for you to join the Friends of the Museum and donate all of your money to the museum. <laughs> they do pay me to say that. Nobody laughed at that joke. Well, tonight's speaker is visiting the U.S. at this point, all the way from Australia. And soon enough, well, actually, she's already joined the physics department at North Carolina State University, and we'll be here in Raleigh full-time, so we'll get her for lots of science cafes in the future for every cool space discovery that comes out. She's nodding yes. I'm going to take that as a positive thing. Dr. Katie Mack is now North, at North Carolina State University Department of Physics and with the new public science cluster at North Carolina State University, so you can expect to hear a lot about the cool research that's coming out of the physics department there in the future. And tonight we're going to be talking about things that are changing the way we look at the universe, right? Recent discoveries in gravitational waves have won Nobel Prizes, has been all over the news. Raise your hand if you saw this stuff in the news just last month or even before that with the discoveries. Yeah, this is crazy stuff happening out there in space. Big things, and it takes a big mind to break it all down and bring it to us here in the Science Cafe. For those of you that are repeat visitors, you know that if I happen to know at least a little something about the speakers, I like to tell stories on them. And so that's what I'm going to do right now. Because the first time I met Katie Mack was in 2012 at a science writing conference. And a whole bunch of the conference participants were hanging out in the hotel lobby, having a good time talking about science and science communication. And then all of a sudden, Katie Mack burst into the lobby and said that somebody had really strong binoculars, and everybody needed to go outside because we could see Jupiter. So she busts in, grabs everybody. Of course, we're all going to go outside and look at the stars and look at the planets, right? So we all rush out, and then she's standing next to this tripod that's got these giant, binoc giant binoculars sitting on it, and she's pointing and almost screaming at us, there's Jupiter! Everybody look. And so everybody took turns. We got to look through the binoculars. And of course, we see Jupiter in incredible glory. And then she's there giving us facts about the planets. And this is, it's like midnight in downtown Raleigh in a conference, okay? I know that Katie Mack brings that passion for astrophysics and for sharing her knowledge about astrophysics and what's going on in our universe to every audience 
whether it's middle of the street in downtown Raleigh or here at the Science Cafe. So give her a warm round of applause and welcome to the stage, Dr. Katie Mack. Hello. Thank you all for being here. Um, this is a fantastic crowd. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, get to talk with you guys tonight. Um, so, so before we start, uh, I want you all to st sit very, very still or stand very, very still, as still as you can. You are not sitting still. You are on a planet that is rotating. We're moving to the east at about 1367 kilometers an hour at the moment. Uh, we are on a planet that is orbiting the sun at about 30 kilometers a second. We are, we are, follow, we are uh, orbiting the center of the galaxy at about 220 kilometers per second. We're not ever sitting still, but there's another way that we're not sitting still, which is that even as you were as still as possible, even if you were in complete empty space, not orbiting anything, just sitting there, you would be buffeted by these waves in space-time itself. You would be moving because space-time, space itself, the fabric of reality is always moving. And this is something that was first predicted um, over 100 years ago by Albert Einstein that, that space itself can have waves in it, can be malleable, can stretch and squeeze. And just uh, in 2015, we saw the first evidence of waves in space-time with our own instruments um, uh, here on the Earth. We detected that waving, that wiggling of space-time ourselves. So one of, the, one of the first, the, one of the big things that Einstein is known for is general relativity. So general relativity is a theory of gravity. Um, let's see if I can get the, ah, here we go. So in general relativity, gravity is not so much like a force between objects as it is um, a consequence of the fact that space itself can be curved. So in this idea, when there's a massive object, it makes sort of a dent in space. And usually it's, it's shown in this sort of two-dimensional thing where you have like a, a sheet with a dent in it from something massive. Uh, you have to think about that in sort of another extra dimension there. So it's really that space-time is kind of curving toward things that have mass. Okay, that's that's the whole idea behind general relativity. And because of that, when things are traveling through space, the the paths of these things are curved, and that includes light. Light travels through space on curved paths because space itself is curving. And we can see that when we look into into the sky, when we look at distant objects. Um, I'm going to show you. So, and and it also, I just want to mention that that the more massive a thing is, the more it curves space. So I showed you this picture of, you know, um, what it looks like if you have a, an object like the Earth curving space. If you have something like a black hole, it makes just a much bigger dent. It curves space much more strongly. So the more massive something is, the more it bends space around it. And we can see evidence of that happening. If we look out into space, um, we can see that massive things can distort the images of things behind them. So in this visualization, um, you can see something moving through this field of stars, right? And what's really happening is this is a, a, a simulation of a black hole moving between us and distant stars. And as that's happening, the light gets bent around that object and makes these sort of curves and rings as it moves past. And you can kind of see how the, the bending of space can be indirectly seen in, in that kind of image. So that's called gravitational lensing. And that's not just theoretical either. We do see that in space. So watch again this, this visualization you see as the, as the black hole moves through. You get these kind of arcs around it as it's going through because the light from the distant objects gets bent around like a lens. If we look out into space and see clusters of galaxies, we see arcs like that around these clusters of galaxies because the light from distant objects is being curved around. So in this image, there's a little blue galaxy on the sort of lower right that's sort of a little stretched out thing. And it's the same galaxy on the upper left making that giant arc where it's the light, it, that's the galaxy that's right behind the cluster of galaxies. This cluster of galaxies is bending space a whole lot, and so it bends the light of that 
little blue galaxy all the way around and you get these arcs. And we can see that everywhere we look in space, we can see that, that consequence of space being malleable, space being bent and light traveling around that bent space. So let's say that you have two black holes, okay? Let's say those two black holes are orbiting each other and they're both bending space as they go. And as they're orbiting each other, those black holes are distorting the space around them and moving, making little sort of waves in that space. As massive objects move around through space, the, the bending of space that they do makes waves go out in the space. So you can see in this visualization, this is two black holes orbiting each other and, and coming together and forming one black hole, and there are sort of waves going out as, that, as that's happening. Now this is, this is called gravitational waves. When massive objects are moving around in space, because they're bending space, they kind of make it wiggle out uh, when that happens. Here's an, I'm gonna show you another visualization of this. So this is again uh, two black holes if I can get it to run. Two black holes orbiting each other. And this is just a visualization of what those waves in space time are like. So as the two black holes are moving around, they make ripples that move out from the center. And as the black holes come together and collide and become one thing, it makes this kind of, it's a sort of wave of, of space time go outward, okay? Um, now, that's not really what it looks like. It's not really ripples on a pond, because th as I said before, that's a kind of two-dimensional idea, and space-time is this three-dimensional thing, so you know the way that space curves around is not quite like that. What's really happening is, let's say that something happens that creates a, a, a wave in space, a gravitational wave, and that wave comes right at me, okay? So let's say it's coming from over there, and it comes right at me, and it hits me in the face, okay? What's gonna happen to me? Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not really gonna sort of bob it up and down like a boat on, a, on an ocean. It's not like that. What's, what happens is the space that I'm in will get wider, like taller this way, and then wider that way. So when this wave comes at me, I'll, be, I'll go taller and wider and taller and wider like that, <laughs> okay? So, so every time a, a wave, of, a space-time wave, a gravitational wave comes at you, you kind of do this kind of thing. All right, that's the, that's the gravitational wave dance. Um, <laughs> if, uh, I, I have a little visualization of that as well. So this is, this is like if you had a circle of particles then it sort of gets wider and then it gets taller as the wave is coming through. So in this visualization, the, the waves are, com are going sort of right through the tube and that's what it does. It stretches and squeezes alternately um, as, as the wave comes through. So we have instruments now that can try and detect the, those changes in the shape of space. Um, that's really hard to do because as the wave is coming at me and I'm getting a little taller and a little wider and a little taller and a little wider, I can't feel that. It's a really, really tiny amount that that's happening to me. Um, so we've had to build the most sensitive instruments ever built in the history of humanity to try to detect those changes. This is a picture of one of the LIGO instruments. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And what this is, is this is a facility where there's a, there's a building in the center and then there's these two arms that go out at 90 degrees. And those arms are vacuum tubes. They're these long tubes uh, evacuated of air completely. Um, and at the ends of the tubes are mirrors. And in the center, there's lasers being shot through those mirrors, or shot toward those mirrors across that four kilometers in each direction. And the, the light goes from the center out to the mirrors and bounces back. Um, and the laser is there to measure how much the lengths of those arms changes as the gravitational wave comes through. Because as the gravitational wave comes through, the arms will get longer and shorter and longer and shorter like that. So this instrument is able to detect 
um, the lengths of those arms changing by a factor of one part in 10 to the 21. So, so those arms are, are um, oh, let me go back, sorry. This clicker is, okay. Okay, so those, those arms are about four kilometers across and they can measure a change in length of about four billionths of a nanometer. This is like something like a thousandth the size of a proton and a proton is like a tiny, tiny part of an atom. So these, this is an incredibly small change in size. So th this, and, and what this, this instrument is doing is, is really measuring how the length of those arms are changing as the gravitational wave comes through and stretches and squeezes and stretches and squeezes. The way it does that is with lasers, as I mentioned. So, so this is a sort of cartoon of what that looks like. The cylinder is the thing that's shooting the laser. It shoots it and it goes through this um, half mirror and, um, sorry, hold on. The clicker is not working all that well. Okay, so the, it goes through this half mirror, bounces off both of those mirrors, and it's set up so that when, when everything's still, uh, the laser light will cancel out. So the way they do that is they have this, this light where they know the wavelength exactly, and they shoot only one wavelength, and the, the waves uh, come back and they combine at the center, and they cancel out completely. So you have, um, just like if you have noise canceling headphones, you can cancel out noise that's outside. These waves, these light waves are set up to cancel each other perfectly, which means that when one arm gets a little bit longer and the other one gets a little bit shorter, that cancellation stops working perfectly and you get a little spot of light at the detector. And that little spot of light is telling you that the, the distances of these arms are changing. And that's telling you that a gravitational wave might be passing by. It could also tell you that a truck has passed by. It could tell you that there's a little earthquake. There are, it could tell you that, that there are so many photons hitting that mirror that it's making it vibrate. And that is a thing that also has to be taken into account in this instrument. It's incredibly, incredibly precise, incredibly careful, and incredibly difficult. It took many, many years to set up this, this facility. They, they built two of these detectors in, in the States, and there are a couple of others um, around the world. There's one that just came online in Italy. Um, they're being built to try to detect these gravitational waves in different parts of the world. And so they expect that you know the, the arms will be stretching and squeezing, but the thing that they're looking for specifically is when that happens because massive objects in distant space are spiraling around each other and colliding. I showed you the visualization of black holes coming together and colliding with each other. That was the main thing that this facility was set up to look for. And it can be calculated what that looks like in terms of what kinds of waves in space-time that sort of collision can make. Uh, the first time that calculation was done was in 2005. The first time it was done really like reliably was in 2005. It's incredibly difficult to do that calculation because you have to do general relativity on a computer, which is, turns out is really hard. Um, but what they found is that as the black holes spiral together, they make a sort of waveform that where the waves are coming at uh, higher and higher frequencies. So it's, it, they're getting faster and faster. And then something happens, the black holes collide, you get a spike in the waves, and then it sort of rings down. And they, they calculated this waveform very exactly in 2005. And then in 2015, just after the LIGO instruments turned on at their highest sensitivity, just when they started taking data in a real way, um, they saw this signal. Now, this, so this, these three panels, the first one is the signal seen in the Hanford detector. There's two LIGO detectors in America, Hanford and Livingston. So the first one is the signal seen in Hanford. Second one is the signal seen in Livingston. And on these, on these plots, there's the, the line of the actual data and the line of the prediction. And unless you're very, very close to the screen, you cannot see the difference. It was incredible seeing these plots for the first time. I mean, I'm a physicist, so I have, you know, I'm, I'm a little different in terms of what excites me, but I saw these plots 
and I was just floored. It just took my breath away because it was, it looks exactly like the prediction. Like you look at the, the numerical calculations, you look at what the instrument actually saw and it's exactly the same. And they match up in just the right way and they, they just showed us that, that these predictions from Einstein's relativity from 100 years before were exactly right. Einstein's picture of the universe worked exactly right. All of the predictions that we could test with that instrument, we tested and they were just what we thought. Um, I'm gonna show you uh, also a, um, a visualization of what this, so this is a visualization and an audio thing. Hopefully the audio will work. But what it is is it, it, it shows kind of the, the signal, how, how strong the signal is, it is at different frequencies, at different times, and then it's converted to audio. The reason it's converted to audio is because these signals happen at the kinds of frequencies that if you convert it to sound, we can hear them. So there's a sort of limited range that the human ear can hear sounds in terms of like frequencies. Sometimes you get too high pitched or sometimes too low pitched. If you take the sort of the way gravitational waves hit us and convert that into sound, you can hear what it sounds like and there's a sort of characteristic sound that gravitational waves would make if they were sound. <laughs> um, so, okay. Okay, do you hear on the second one, this, that little, that little blip? Okay, um, the second one is actually sped up because black holes, it turns out, are a little too slow to make a cool sound. Um, but they, you, can, you can still hear it, but the, the sound is called a chirp. It goes whoop, like that. Okay, so black holes, when they come together, they come together pretty quickly and they go whoop. Or, you know, if, if you stretch it out, it would be like whoop. That's called a chirp. It's, it's kind of the way that the frequency rises up um, as the black holes are coming together. They're coming together faster and faster and faster and faster, and that's why they make that sort of chirping noise. Um, but black holes aren't the only things that can come together and collide with each other. So black holes, I should, probably should have said this at the beginning, a black hole is a sort of the end state of a very massive star after it collapses on itself and creates this kind of dent in space. And it's sort of an object that's just so incredibly compact that it's just a dent in space itself. Um, there are other objects out there that are very, very massive, very, very compact. And one of them is this thing. This is a neutron star. This is a, a drawing of a neutron star. Um, what it shows is the sort of the star and a magnetic field. Usually neutron stars, when we see them, have these very strong magnetic fields. And when they're rotating and the rotation axis and the magnetic field axis are a little bit misaligned, they can do this thing where they shoot sort of jets of radiation at us every time they come around. This is, this is called a pulsar. And this is how we usually know about neutron stars because they, they give us these pulses of radiation. We know about a bunch of these neutron stars that do these pulses of radiation. A neutron star is kind of like if a star is not really massive enough to create a black hole when it dies, sometimes it creates a neutron star, which is still an incredibly dense thing, um, but not quite dense enough to collapse into a black hole, or not quite massive enough to collapse into a black hole. But it's a, it's a star that's basically, it's as dense as like an atomic nucleus, but it's the entire thing is like that. So if you took a neutron star that was a little bit more massive than the sun, it would only be a couple of kilometers across. Um, and whenever, whenever you hear about neutron stars, they, they try and, you know, you read about them in like popular press and they try and impress upon you that neutron stars are very, very dense. And even though they're really massive, they're really small. And they do that by comparing uh, a neutron star to a city, right? So they put like the neutron star on top of New York and they're like, that's how big the neutron star is. It would like be sit right on top of Manhattan. And you can actually find on the Goddard website neutron stars compared to a number of different cities. Um, so you can see a neutron star sitting on top of Chicago and Montreal and um, I think San Francisco. Anyway, so if you wanna see a sort of apocalyptic neutron star death thing, on, you can find it on the NASA website. Uh, I chose New York because it was nearby, but whatever. Um, anyway, so a neutron star is this incredibly dense sort of carcass of a star. It's after the star has burned out all its fuel, it's, it's um, blown up and there's the leftover core is a neutron star. And we know that sometimes neutron stars can be orbiting each other in pairs. 
And we've known for a long time that the LIGO instruments should be able to see gravitational waves from those two. They should be able to see gravitational waves from neutron stars that are coming together. And what would happen is you'd have these two neutron stars and they'd be orbiting each other and they'd get really close and they'd start to like distort and um, sort of stretch toward each other and then they'd something would happen and they'd combine together and then they would sort of create some kind of radiation outflow thing. Um, one of the things that, that we've, um, we've thought neutron stars might do when they collide is create gamma ray bursts. Um, that's the, there's these bursts of gamma radiation, very hard radiation that can be seen at very, very long distances. And so maybe when they come together, they collide, they make a gamma ray burst, and then they collapse into being a black hole at the center of some kind of cocoon of material. And the exciting thing about that would be that if we could see the gravitational waves from neutron stars coming together and also see the burst of radiation that comes out, then we can learn something, some really cool things about what's going on in, with these systems. So, um, so, when, so when we when we have a gamma, a, a neutron star is coming together, you get a chirp like you do with the, the black holes, but it's a slightly different chirp because they orbit really, really close for a really long time. So you get a sort of longer lead up, and then and then you get a higher pitched kind of chirp at the end. So I'm going to try and play this uh, audio file, and I'm not sure if it'll work, but I'll bear with me. Hold on. Yeah? <laughs> okay, that worked. Cool. Um, I'm going to play that again, because I just think it sounds really cool. Okay, ready? Oh, wait, hold on. Hold on. Wait. Hold on. Okay. So, so that's the chirp of, of neutron stars coming together. That's, that's what kind of waveform they should make. And it turns out that the, that the LIGO instruments should be able to detect them for much longer than for uh, black holes because they, they have this longer, like, ooh, you know, they have this longer lead up, right? And so just a few months ago, the LIGO experiment saw something that, that's, that, you know, in their instruments sounded just like that. Right, something that made just that kind of waveform. Um, two neutron stars coming together about 130 million light years away. And they, and they um, were able to measure this for a really long time because the orbits stayed in the sort of frequency range that LIGO can detect for much longer than the black holes. So LIGO has detected a number of black hole collisions. This is a plot of some of those of those those black hole collisions where those are the chirps of all the black holes. You know, they go for up to like two seconds almost in terms of how quickly these things go. But the neutron stars, when they collided, um, gave a signal that LIGO could detect for a very long time. It turns out that, that they were able to detect this sort of chirp going for about a minute. That was how long it was in the right sort of frequency range. This video goes for a minute and I, I, it takes too long, so I'm just gonna skip to the end. Um, but at the end, you can hear, you can hear the chirp from, from the data of what was actually detected. Okay, so let's, this one's a little quiet, so let's see if we can hear it. So that's, that's the waveform that the LIGO instrument detected. So you can hear the similarity, it's the same, it's the same thing. That was those two neutron stars coming together, colliding with each other and throwing out gravitational waves that traveled 130 million years to reach us here. Um, there's, this is also, this is a, one of the, a, an illustration of that, um, the sort of frequency versus time Plot. I'm going to show you this one because you can actually see in the data the, the trace of the, the, of the um, chirp. And this video has the noise on top of it too, like the, the sort of other random vibrations that, that LIGO was able to detect that's just other stuff. But you can hear the sort of static and then you can hear the chirp behind the static. Is it was such a strong signal that it stuck out and, and was, you know, sort of, detectable that way. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna play this video. This is 
you have to listen really carefully because there's a lot of static and then there's a little, very quiet little chirp at the end. So hopefully you'll be able to hear it. And, and look for the, the signal to start showing up as that line comes across. You should start to see the line of the, the signal rising up. So can you see that line sort of starting to trace out? That's the, sig the frequency rising. I thought that was amazing. When I've watched that video dozens of times because I just think it's so cool. You can see the you can see the the line of the the frequency traced out where the signal is detected, and you can hear it below the noise, like it's right there. It was it was detected. So that was a super cool thing. The other super cool thing, in, in addition to just detecting the gravitational waves from these things, is that you know something else happened when these neutron stars were orbiting each other. They're coming together, and when they collide, because they're stars, they're not black holes, there's a lot of matter happening. You know, there's a lot of stuff there. And they create these, this incredible jet of material. This is just a visualization, of course. But they create this incredible jet of material, they create all this radiation, and they create a burst of gamma rays that we can detect uh, here on Earth. This video has like a lot of fancy NASA stuff at the end, which I just think is kind of pretty. Um, so when that gravitational wave was detected by LIGO, as soon as they got a signal of neutron stars colliding, they were like, okay, we have to tell everybody. These things are supposed to be secret, but they had to tell everybody because they had to tell the astronomers, go look at that spot in the sky and tell us if you see anything, because they expected th to find a burst of gamma rays and maybe a whole bunch of other radiation from all that stuff happening when those stars were colliding. And so they told the people who run the Gamma Ray Observatory, uh, the Fermi Space Telescope that's looking for bursts of gamma radiation in space, and they had a gamma ray burst. They had a burst of radiation that came in just 1.7 seconds after the gravitational waves. They also pointed every other telescope on Earth at the same part of the sky. And observatories from all continents on Earth, including Antarctica, took data and saw something happening in that part of the sky. This is just one of the observations. So on the left-hand panel here, you can see a sort of bright galaxy and a little spot just to the upper left of the galaxy. And on the right-hand panel, you see that spot is now dimmed. That little spot appeared at, like, just right around the time of that gravitational wave merger. They couldn't get the, the they couldn't get the telescope on it at the same second, but they got it on, you know, pretty quickly within a couple hours, and they saw this little bright dot that hadn't been there before, and that's the afterglow of this explosion. So there was the explosion, there was the gamma rays that came out, and then all of that material that got heated up by the explosion of those two stars coming together um, resulted in that little, that little dot. And so because of that, we were able to confirm that neutron stars colliding can make and we were able to study what was formed when those neutron stars collided. We were able to see that they were creating heavy elements. So when we look at all of the elements in the periodic table of elements, they, they're formed in different ways. Some of them were formed at the Big Bang. Some of them are formed inside stars like our sun. Some of them are formed at supernovae when stars are, are, are um, exploding at the end of their lives. And now we know that some of these elements can be formed, at least in some cases, by collisions of neutron stars. Because when we look to the light coming from this, this little glow in that distant galaxy, we saw Trace, we saw features in that that told us that there were some of these heavy elements like gold and platinum. So now we know a little bit more about how all of the stuff on Earth gets here because we've been able to see gravitational waves and um, and this, these uh, bursts of radiation from these stars colliding. So there are a number of things that, that the LIGO experiment has seen so far. This is a plot of 
um, masses of black holes and neutron stars that, um, that we've detected in various ways. So the blue things in this picture are black holes that the LIGO experiment has seen from their colli collisions creating new black holes of higher masses. The purple ones are black holes we knew about because there were things falling into them and we could see the radiation coming from that. The yellow dots are neutron stars that we knew about because they were pulsars generally. And then there's, there's one extra little pair of neutron stars coming together to make a slightly bigger something. Um, that, that's that, that one that we just detected from the neutron stars colliding. We think probably what happened is that the neutron stars came together, they, um, they were swirling around, they created one more massive neutron star that was spinning so fast that it was kind of held up by its own spinning for a little while and then it cl collapsed into being a black hole. So that's probably what happened. And that probably accounts for part of the reason why there was that slight delay of 1.7 seconds between when we got the gravitational waves, which travel at the speed of light, and when we got the gamma rays from the explosion. So probably what happened is it took a little while for the neutron stars to come together and collapse, and then it took a little while for that sort of jet of radiation to fight its way out of the debris and um, start moving through space. So, okay, so we promised this would not be a long talk, so I hope I haven't gone over too much, um, but uh, I'm ready to take questions. There are probably, there are probably a lot of things I, I didn't get to um, and didn't explain very well, so ask anything about gravitational waves, black holes, neutron stars, anything like that, thanks. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> All right. So the way the rest of the night works is we get to ask questions and ask hard ones. She's smart, I think she handled it. So if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll have to bring a microphone to you. That way all the people who are watching at home and the folks there in the back of the room can hear you as well. I'll get to you with a microphone and it looks like I'm gonna start. I saw the first hand here in the back. Thank you, great talk, appreciate it. Um, question, gravitational waves. Now photons, as they go through space-time, have to follow that curvature of space-time, and so they're affected by it. Are yeah. gravitational waves the foundation upon which photons wiggle, or are gravitational waves in and of themselves subject to the mass density variances in the universe? Okay, that's a great question. So um, light, uh, so when, when photons move through space, when light moves through space, uh, they don't need gravitational waves uh, to do that. They, they don't need gravity to do that. But, they, but light and gravitational waves both follow the curvature of space. And this is actually super, super important for uh, a slightly esoteric aspect of this neutron star thing, which I'm going to tell you about anyway because it's so cool. Um, so I mentioned that the the light and the gravity, uh, the light and the gravitational waves arrived at about the same time. It was within it was 1.7 seconds over 130 million years. So that's the same time, right? Um, and and that's, that's not surprising because gravitational waves and light both travel at the speed of light. We, we knew that before. But the, the, thing where, the thing where it gets really cool is that as they're traveling through space, they're going in and out of dents in space because they're moving, so they had to move out of the galaxy they were in, so that, that came out, uh, they, they were coming out of a dent in space there. And then they had to go into our galaxy so they're going into a dent in space there, and there are other things along the way that have gravity that they moved through and moved past. So they they made they went through a, a path that was not just straight a straight line. There was some curving in that path, and the fact that they made they both came at the same time means that they both responded in the same way to the curving of space, which wasn't guaranteed. There are theories of gravity that say that light and gravity should respond differently to gravitational fields. And this shows that they don't. They respond exactly the same way, which is very important if you're interested in changes to gravity that might try and explain away dark matter or dark energy, things like that. Um, a lot of those theories are ruled out because the light and the gravity responded to those dents in space time in just the same way. What is it about um, objects colliding with each other as opposed to just rotating that you were looking for? Like why, you know, 
like so uh, you know events that are millions or billions of light years away versus just some you know binary star system in the neighborhood yeah that's a great question too so everything that accelerates through space creates a gravitational wave i'm creating a gravitational wave this is creating a gravitational wave but it's very small um stars that are orbiting each other in a stable way create gravitational waves but very small very small ones because they're not going that fast and it's only when things are going really, really fast, like relativistic speeds. So when the objects are moving at close to the speed of light that they're creating gravitational waves that are powerful enough to really be detectable by instruments like LIGO. So it's, it's really just when they're right about to collide that we're able to see the things. If, if it were possible, so you know that the neutron stars were in the, in the right frequency range and the right strength for like a minute, if they weren't, if they were able to keep that tight orbit without colliding, we, we we could just see that. But once they're in that tight orbit, the gravitational waves are actually pulling energy out of the system, so it's making them tighter and tighter and tighter. And so when they get to that final moment where they're colliding, they create that big burst, and that's the thing that's a, that's really easy to see. So that's why we look for collisions. I'm well. If you're like looking at a picture of a cluster of galaxies. It's like there are different colors, like orange and blue and purple, but in space, is it actually those colors? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yes, they, they really are, these objects really are different colors in space. Um, so, for example, when we look at a cluster of galaxies, a lot of times the galaxies inside the cluster look kind of orangish, and there might be other galaxies maybe outside the cluster that look a little bit more blue. And the reasons for that is they have different kinds of stars in them. So there are stars that look more blue, there are stars that look more red. It turns out the very, very old stars look more red, and some of the really massive young stars look more blue. And so when you have a galaxy that's making a lot of stars, it looks more blue because it's making a lot of these stars that don't live very long. And so they must be very young, and they must be, and some of them are very massive, so they're very blue. Whereas if you have a galaxy that's not making a lot of stars, then all of the young stars have died out, and you just have these older, redder stars left over. So the main differences you see in galaxies colors is that some are more red and some are more blue, and then there is a kind, there are kind of gradations, gradations along there. But there really are a lot of different colors, and there are even some weird things in space that are like green and stuff like that. Um, so when you see images of space, uh, like galaxies, clusters, and things, there's those, those two colors aren't always exactly what you would see with your eye, but they do correspond to, you know, maybe different kinds of uh, light coming from the galaxy, maybe some more infrared or some more ultraviolet or maybe sometimes different chemicals that we can see. Um, but so those, they're not, they're not totally made up. They do correspond to something real in space. I, I have a question about the detector. I, I understand that the interferometer should uh, work well for uh, seismic waves. But I don't see how it works if space itself stretches. Why doesn't the laser respond exactly the same as the uh, path across which it traverses? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, too. Um, for that question, I need to get into special relativity, which is great, because special relativity is awesome. Oh, okay. I think we still have time. OK, yeah. good, good. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so so the the issue there is that the speed of light is the same no matter what you do to space. Um, that's the kind of main point of special relativity. This is the speed of light doesn't change. So no matter what you're doing to space, the light that's traveling through that space is always going to go at the speed of light. And so when you use lasers like this, if the if the length of that arm gets a little bit longer, um, the light is going to take a little longer to get to the end because it's still going the same speed. Even though the, the distance has changed, it's going the same speed. So it'll take a little longer to get to the end, and then it'll, that'll mean the phase is a little bit off when it comes back. And so when the two light beams combine again at the, at the center, um, they're gonna be a little bit off because one of the light beams took a little too long. And so that's how it's measuring the distance, is that it's using the fact that the speed of light never changes. Um, and so even though the, everything else in the detector is stretched, and even the wavelength of the light is stretched a little bit, it still takes a little longer to go through, and that, that makes the difference. Well, that, that was the perfect question for before this question. Um, 
I'm kind of fascinated by the, the graphs that you showed with the chirp. Uh -huh. But, and I've, I've seen them in a little bit more detail with their, you know, the uh, amount of error in them and stuff like that. But I really don't understand them. And what is the frequency on the y axis? Okay, so the graphs, of, I'm going to see if I can go back on this um, plot. Um, okay, so like this graph, like, the, uh, oh, okay, hold on. Uh, this this graph, okay. So so what this is okay. So what this is showing is the the height of the wiggles is the strain. The strain is like how much the space is being stretched, and the um, and the the y the bottom axis is just time. So what it's saying is that as the as the gravitational wave comes through, the stronger gravitational wave is stretching more. And the, the, the stronger stretches come f closer together as time goes on. So that's why you get the, the rising frequency is that, well, basically, I mean, the frequency of the gravitational wave corresponds exactly to how quickly those stars are moving around or the black holes are moving around. And so as the black holes get closer together, um, the waves are coming closer together in terms of like you're stretching, you know, you're stretching more quickly, um, <laughs> but you're also stretching more that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, the difference in, in the in the intensity of the stretching um, of space measured at the at the interferometer. Yeah. Uh, what's inside of a black hole? What's inside of a black hole? Uh -huh. um, that's a very good question. Uh, so fundamentally, we we cannot possibly know. Um, because once something goes inside a black hole, it can't tell us anything about what happened to it. There's, there's this rule um, where there's the, the edge of a black hole is called the event horizon, and anything that goes inside the event horizon cannot send any information out, at least unless you get into some really complicated theoretical stuff that may or may not work out. Um, so so if, I, if I have a black hole and I throw a toaster in there, um, I, I don't find out what happened to that toaster. In some sense, the toaster is there, but in some sense, it's not really, because if we waited for long enough, that black hole would, like, would shrink and evaporate and sort of turn into radiation, and we wouldn't be able to tell that it was a toaster, at least not in any reasonable way. Um, and also, once the toaster goes in there, it has to move toward the center of the black hole. Um, it cannot move any other direction. And so everything that goes in there has to move toward the center of the black hole. And at the center of the black hole, mathematically, there's something called a singularity, which is like a point of infinite density. Usually in physics, when we have a point of infinite density, that means something's gone wrong and we need to change something. Um, but formally, when we write these things down, there's a, there's a singularity. Everything goes into that. Um, but when I think of what a black hole is on the inside, I think more about like that picture I showed almost at the very beginning, I'll go back to it. Um, so like this, this picture where you have like a sort of dent in space time that just keeps going down. Um, so I think of black holes as just pure space time, a, a pure space time object. It's just a dent in space because you can't, all you can define about it is its mass, you can define its charge and its spin, but basically it's just mass. And so, and mass is just, you know, dense in space, and so you can think of a black hole as just pulling that that space, you know, sheet all the way down and just keep going. And so that's what I think of when I think of what's inside a black hole. Hi. Um, so the, these mergers of these massive objects can happen in various orientations, so from edge-on to face-on. Yeah. Is the, does the signal change when it changes, basically, inclination? Yes, it does, yeah. Um, so... <sighs> I don't remember which way it goes. I think formally, if it's if it's one or the other, you can't see it at all. I think maybe if it's like fully face on, you can't see it, and if it's edge on, you see it hard, uh, strongest. Uh, it might might be the other way around. You might have to check that. But one of the directions is harder to see, um, just because the the way that the gravitational waves sort of interfere with each other. Um, but um, yeah, sorry. Sorry, so so it does go to zero at one orientation. Yeah, but it has to be so perfect that I don't think we. I, I think it, it kind of doesn't matter, um, but but yeah. So so there is some inclination, and I think we actually might have got some data on the inclination um, 
Or if we, if we knew the inclination of the previous event, then we would know something really cool in addition to what we already know, which is a lot of really cool stuff. Um, so, so that does become important at some point, but in terms of, um, in terms of just like what we've measured, uh, we haven't done a whole lot with that, I think. Um, but yeah, it does, it does make a difference at some level, yeah. Could you please, and you touched upon it earlier, can you uh, or speak a little bit more about the potential for the mass messaging? I mean, with over 5,000 eyes on the skies, you know, from the August event, is there any worldwide effort to coordinate, you know, to, to get a lot more, like I said, eyes on the skies? or Because that's almost unprecedented, isn't it? Yeah, so um, w there were a lot of people looking at this, at this event. Um, one estimate I saw was that 15% uh, of all professional astronomers were involved in this discovery um, by taking data of this event at some wavelength of light. Or, or with the uh, gravitational waves. Um, there's a lot of discussion in, in the uh, physics community about how exactly to get the messages out. Um, there's, there's something called the Astronomer's Telegram, which, which puts out uh, announcements. I don't know if they use that exactly for this, but there are, there are sort of mechanisms within the community to uh, contact people at, at telescopes. I think in this case, a lot of it was, you know, the person, um, the person in like the person so if there's a gamma ray burst you, the pr people who study gamma ray bursts get text messages saying there's a gamma ray burst and then they tell all their astronomer friends go look at the gamma ray burst um the people who were who were um looking for this signal some of them got like emails saying you need to point your telescope at this thing right now and then they called their friends and then they called up the person who was at the telescope at that time and said stop looking at a galaxy look at this thing instead um and so I think in this case, it was kind of, um, it was not haphazard, certainly, but there was, there was a lot of like sort of person to person. And I don't know how much more automated that's gonna get as these things get more common. But that's something that is definitely a uh, subject of much discussion in the community right now. Because there's worry that, you know, like, they, in some sense, they want to keep these things kind of secret because some of them could be false alarms and because there's some value in having the discovery first and being able to analyze it and, and all of that before it gets all public. Um, but at the same time, you do want as much data as possible. So it, it's kind of, it's a trade-off and I'm not sure exactly how that's all gonna come out in the end. I wish I got emails like that at work. Uh, when, when the neutron stars are rotating and they're close together, they're rotating very rapidly. But yet the plots of the uh, waves are really low frequency. Um, the, they're, not, they're not low frequency. I mean, they're... The chart shows them really uh, you know, within uh, milliseconds. Yeah, but they're going, they're going like, uh, they're going around each other um, Within milliseconds, but they're but they're like several kilometers apart still, at that point. So they're they're moving very very fast, um, but uh, they're moving around each other through space. And so uh, at at the point like they're they're a couple of kilometers across, like maybe a, a, on order of ten kilometers across. And I think their separation toward the end was on order like maybe fifty kilometers. And so then by the time they they get to be touching, then they then then it's all done, right? And they do distort as they come together. So so you have to work out like how uh, how many times they're orbiting and how far apart they are, and then that you know that gives you what the frequency is. But they're moving very very quickly. They're they're basically relativistic at that point. Question on um, the events at quantum level, and also in quantum um, another item with quanta involved. When the gravitational wave occurs, are there any aspects of it right now being measured for effects in a quantum level at this range, or are we still way too far away from having that technology? Um, I'm not sure what you, what you mean uh, about at, at a quantum level. If we're, okay, if we're thinking of uh, the gravitational wave is moving space, it's distorting space. And of course, at a quantum level, we're looking at um, items that are, you know, minuscule. 
but they do react even in a gravitational manner. One of the things I'm thinking of is have we looked at something like a quantum entanglement as another possible instrument where we would be able, not just with a laser, but also with two entangled particles within a you know two kilometer range or something like that as a means of detection. Oh, uh, so you're asking sort of would a gravitational wave break the entanglement between two particles and well, allow you to see that? Not necessarily break it, but if we had, you know, at 90 degrees and two sets of entangled uh, particles, would we able, be able to use that as a detector with more precision? Uh, I, I don't know of a mechanism for that, um, so I, I, don't, I don't know how that would work. I, I haven't heard anything about, about that kind of thing. This may be for another night, and it's not technical at all. So if it takes a large object like the Earth or a black hole to bend space, can space ever bend, like in the photo there, enough so that one side touches the other, thus creating maybe a wormhole? Is that right? Ah, yeah. Um, that's, yeah, that's a good question. So, so yeah, a wormhole, a wormhole would be something where you would have uh, two distant sections of space kind of coming together. Um, yeah, so one thing is that this is a little misleading because this is the wrong number of dimensions for what's actually happening. So the way that space is really bending in a picture like this is that it's kind of squeezing on itself in a, in a way that, that doesn't lend itself to reconnections in quite that way. Um, but wormholes uh, formed in other ways uh, are mathematically not ruled out. Um, there are, there are uh, theories that do involve wormholes they're very difficult to make worm, it's very difficult to theoretically make a wormhole and keep it stable. Um, so, so you need some kind of matter or energy that we don't have access to and may not exist. Um, but there are certain theories where wormholes could be useful. So there's still an area of active research, which is what you say when we say we don't really know what's going on with those. Um, but, uh, but this kind of thing, as far as I know, couldn't couldn't do anything with a wormhole. It just it just sort of squeeze, you know, distorts space a lot. First of all, welcome to Wolfpack Physics. It's exciting to have you. You're well known for your research down into dark matter, and you briefly mentioned some of the implications that the gravitational waves have towards that. What are the other big significant, you know, relations that now have, you know? effect from the gravitational waves? Uh, gosh, um, there's so many implications for the, from this stuff, especially with this most recent uh, discovery. So I mentioned the dark matter stuff um, where certain models of, certain ways of trying to explain away dark matter or dark energy by changing gravity don't work anymore now that we know that the gravity and the light travel through the same gravitational potentials. Um, there are big implications for how neutron stars explode, so how we get gamma ray bursts. Um, there's that, that 1.7 seconds is something that people are still trying to figure out exactly what happened there because, you know, it's, it seems clear that the light and the gravity were traveling at the same speed, but there is that delay, and it's not that easy to get a two-second delay when something as violent as a star collapsing is happening. So that means there probably was this sort of rotating massive star that collapsed on itself, and, and then there's implications for how the, the jet comes through the, the material, and um, that's going to be a really exciting thing. There are new simulations being put together already for trying to explain that. Um, there's implications, as I said, for the origin of the elements. Um, and then uh, there's also like implications for how stars form and die, because once we're able to uh, see a lot of these gravitational waves, we'll be able to count how many dead stars there are that are orbiting each other, which tells us something about how many, there, how many are born and how they come together to form binaries, and, and um, then that can tell us more about like, how galaxies form, so there's that. And then you can also use gravitational waves to learn about the stuff between here and there, and so there, there are some implications for potential dark matter theories that rely on um, studying how the gravitational waves are traveling through the space between here and the distant galaxies. And then as we build new gravitational wave detectors, we'll be able to study how galaxies collide with each other because we'll be able to measure when supermassive black holes um, collide with each other. And that's, that's sort of in the future, but 
um, we're we're at a point where we're we're able to and we're potentially able to detect some of those things too with different kinds of observations. Uh, so there's those, and then there's all sorts of uh, um, implications for oh for what neutron stars are made of. So we know that they're this incredibly dense stuff that's kind of like at the centers of atoms, but whether they're made of like quark soup or some kind of um, super fluid stuff or um, like how the, the neutrons kind of crystallize out, like all of that stuff is really unknown. And so we're learning, we like this has already told us something about what neutron stars are made of and how that matter, which we can't even simulate in the lab because it's too dense, how that matter works. So there's that. And then there's like how black holes work. So, you know, strong, really strong gravity. We're going to learn about how, how black holes are shaped and, and how they, they work and, um, you know, what happens to their event horizons and do they have extra properties that we didn't know about. And um, so, I mean, the list just can keep going on. This is an incredible um, new sort of look at astronomy and physics that we've just never had before. So. Yeah, I could I could keep going, but I won't because there are probably other questions. But yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question about the Great Red Spot on Jupiter. Okay. What have they learned about that? What do, sorry? What have they learned about that? Like, what have they discovered about the red spot? Um, you mean so the red spot has been known about for a while. Um, so it's it's. It's a big storm, and it's been going for at least a uh, hundred years. Um, and the, the way we're learning about the Great Red Spot on Jupiter is, is right now is uh, through the Juno mission, which is the satellite that's orbiting Jupiter at the moment. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of really cool stuff uh, going on with the Juno mission, um, and we're we're figuring it, we're finding out that the Great Red Spot is shrinking for one thing. That's something that has is sort of recent, and we're starting to, starting to learn about what Jupiter is made of um, on the inside and, and how far down the clouds go and just how the storms work in general. Um, but uh, I, yeah, there's, there, there would be, there, there's a lot to talk about with Jupiter, um, but uh, uh, there's, it's, um, yeah, so that's kind of another topic. Um, but yeah, we're 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 learning a lot from the Juno mission, and that's just getting more and more data. So so look that up and and check out some of the pictures from that because they're incredible, um, and uh, and follow along with with that because it's it's really really cool stuff. You get some big binoculars. Yes. Oh yeah. And if you do have big binoculars, you can see the moons of Jupiter, which was the important thing about about that thing was not just looking at Jupiter, but looking at the moons of Jupiter. Because if you because if you watch the moons of Jupiter move around Jupiter, then you can do just what Galileo did, and and prove that you know the Earth is not the center of the universe. Anyway, that's another topic. Okay. So um, if a neutron star, like when two neutron stars fuse. Most stars are already made of hydrogen and helium, but how would all the heavier metals be coming out in such large quantities if there's already a huge quantity of the helium and hydrogen, and it's also releasing that, those two elements? How do all four, like all the huge amount of the low, tier, low, low atomic mass elements and high atomic mass elements come out of the neutron stars? Okay, so uh, so how do we make lots of different elements when neutron stars come together? Um, so neutron stars are made almost entirely of neutrons. Um, so they're, they're, they're just like this atomic nucleus material, but there are sort of trace amounts of other elements like on the, co on the surface of the neutron star and in the, in the uh, sort of material around the neutron star. And when the neutron stars collide, you get this huge input of energy that allows elements to capture neutrons and become, um, become heavier elements through a process of capturing neutrons and then neutrons turning into protons through weak nuclear interactions. And you can get this kind of fusion of higher and higher elements through having just a heck of a lot of neutron stars coming together really, really quickly at very high densities and very high temperatures and pressures. So the this is, uh, you know, this whole nucleosynthesis thing is a very complicated topic. Um, but basically, 
like when usually we make heavy elements through things like uh, uh, supernova where you've got a star that's burned all its hydrogen and it's burned all its helium and it's made high, heavier and heavier elements and then you get a whole lot of energy coming in because it's exploding and then that makes some heavier elements but in this case you're um, you're creating higher elements by uh, throwing a lot of neutrons at something really quickly and that sort of builds up the elements so um, it's it's called the R process. Um, if you if you want to look that up, but you can. Um, there there are a few people here at NC State who who work on how supernovae and and uh, other processes can make higher, heavier elements. And I'm I'm not one of the people who works on that, but there's um, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on there. So definitely look it up. Let's give her one more round of applause. <laughs> what an awesome science cafe. Thank you, Katie, for being here. Thanks to all of you for coming out tonight to the Science Cafe. Before I let you go, next Thursday night, 7 o'clock, right here in the Daily Planet Cafe, we've got museum scientist Adrian Smith from the Evolutionary Biology Lab and artist Gabriella Duggan, who worked with Adrian on a science and art collaboration. We're going to add a little bit of steam to our STEM next Thursday night. So don't miss out. There's an incredible art piece up in his lab. So come during open museum hours. You can take a look at that on the third floor of this building. You can see what she made out of ant nests and other materials. It's a gorgeous piece of art. And next Thursday, we'll be taking people up to see it after the cafe. So you don't want to miss next Thursday night. Also, of course, Thursday after that, we won't be here. That's a holiday, right? But I hope to see you all again here at the Science Cafe. Thanks from all of us here at the museum. Have a great night, everybody. <laughs>